baby on the deals next So today's class is uh, the first part we're going to do on uh, distributed transactional database systems, or sorry, yeah, distributed transactional database systems. Uh, I modified the schedule this morning because it was originally going to be distributed OTP, then distributed OLAP, then cloud systems. I've decided that I'm going to extend what we're going to talk about today now across two lectures because there's just so much we want to cover. Um, and then from when we do talk about the OLAP stuff uh, next week, after we come back from the break, uh, I'll talk about the cloud stuff that, that I would have mentioned in a separate lecture. So I think this is the right pacing because last, last year we, we, we rushed too much. All right, so this is the final docket for everything that's due in this class. Uh, project three is due today. Um, project or Homework five will be going out today or tomorrow, and that'll be due two weeks from today. Project four will be going out today or tomorrow, and that'll be due on the 10th. The extra credit assignment is due on the 12th. I extended that by one more day. And then our beloved final exam is Sunday morning, not in this room, some other room, at 8.30 a.m., okay? I had no, no say on this. I'll bring coffee and cigarettes for people if you want to, right? <laughs> I know they give out candy, but that's at 8.30 a.m. I don't want any candy, right? Okay. So that's, that's, this is niche. We're, we're almost done for the semester. Um, the other things that come, are sort of coming up to be mindful of is that we're having uh, the lead engineer Volti, from VoltDB come to give a guest lecture in our class on Monday, December 3rd. So I'll send a reminder about that. Everyone should attend. And then on Wednesday, December 5th, so after the VoltDB guest lecture, I'm going to do the final exam review. Um, but I'm also going to do what I do every year is what I call the systems potpourri. So we spent a lot, a lot of time mostly talking about Postgres and MySQL and sort of databases at a high level throughout this entire semester. But on this last class, what you can go do is if you go to that URL, uh, it'll be a Google form with a bunch of different database systems uh, from the, the dbdb.io website. And you guys can vote for whatever system you want to learn about. Right? And then I'll pick whatever top three systems get the most votes. Then I'll come and do like a crash course, like spending 10, 15 minutes for each system just to tell you what are the things you need to know about it, what makes it different, what makes it special, or what makes it suck. OK? So again, the idea is if there's some system that like you use at an internship or you think you want to go get a job at a company that's building it and you want to learn more about it, use this opportunity to, uh, you know, to, to, to have me come teach, you, teach it. Don't use it to cheat on your extra credit, right? If you really want, if you're, you know, if you're writing the article on, you know, System X, and you hey, let's have Andy, vote, you know, discuss System X so I can figure out how to write my article for extra credit. Don't do that, right? Uh, so vote once, but you can vote for as many systems as you want, okay? And then the other thing I'm also doing, and I'll post this on Piazza as well, is that the extra credit is due on uh, Wednesday, December 12th, but one week before on Wednesday, December 5th, if you want to submit it early and get feedback from me or the, one of the TAs about what, what you're doing right and not right, uh, what you should correct, what you should fill out more, then I can give you feedback, and that way you can assure that you can get full credit on the, on the assignment, okay? Because in previous years, people sort of, they, you know, you may not know what, what I'm expecting uh, because it's different from all the other uh, the projects and homeworks we've done in the class, and it's a sort of subjective thing because it's based on how well you find information and how well you can write about what the systems are doing. So I'll provide you guys feedback to say, yes, this, you're doing this correctly or you're doing this wrong, OK? And then for the upcoming database talks, we have, uh, so next week, after we come back to break on November 29th, uh, we have uh, Swarm64, the founder of Swarm64 coming out from, I think, it's either London or Norway. I can't keep track. Uh, and these guys are really interesting because this is actually now a, a specialized hardware accelerator that they've developed specifically to do database operations on hardware. So instead of using the, like a general purpose GPU or using the CPU, they actually have a custom chip that they use for, uh, for, for their system. So think of this as like you know, the Google's TensorFlow processing unit, TP, TPU, but specifically for databases instead. So that's very interesting. And then also on the same day when the VoltDB guy comes gives, gives a guest lecture, he's going to give a more researchy talk the same day at, at 4.30 PM with a database research group meeting. Okay. All right, so any questions about what's expected from you from now until the end of the semester? OK. So let's jump right into the material. So as I said, this part of the, of the semester, now we're going to start talking about distributed databases. 
We already talked about parallel databases before, and we said the distinction between the two of them was that a parallel database was one where you're going to assume that the, the, the resources you're, you're communicating with, like the other CPUs, the other nodes in, in, in your cluster, are connected to you with a, a, a fast communication fabric. And that that communication fabric is going to be reliable. And that you don't have to worry about messages getting lost, nodes going down. Right? You can write your algorithms, you can build a system architecture assuming that whoever you're you know, handing off work to or reading writing data from is going to be there throughout the entire execution of the query. Right? Again, the simplest parallel machine to think about is a single rack unit with two, two CPU sockets. Right? I can write my hash joint algorithm talking to the two CPU sockets without worrying about you know, one socket catching on fire and disappearing. Because right? if that happens, then, then my socket is going down too. So now we're going to start talking about distributed databases. And for this one, we can't assume now that the other nodes that are in our database system are, are reliable and that the communication between them is going to be fast. Right? Fast would be like on the same motherboard. right? Now you might be in the same rack, but you're on a different machine, and now you've got to go over an Ethernet cable. So in this environment, we, you know, we need to build our system out in such a way that we can be more fault tolerant. Meaning if one node goes down, we don't take down the whole, the whole cluster. Now, it may kill a query that we're running right now, depending on how, how fault tolerant we, we are. But we're not, again, the machine's not going to you know, grind to halt if, just, if one machine goes down. OK, so to build now a distributed database system, right? We're going to use all the things we talked about through the entire semester now as building blocks to build out a, a sort of a multi-node multi architecture. And I may be thinking, like, why am I waiting until the end of the semester before we start talking about distributed databases? I, I, want, to talk about, I want to start talking about distributed databases now. The problem is you, you can't talk about distributed databases until you understand what the hell is going on in a single node. Right? So all the same issues that we had before, how to do query planning, how to do optimization, how to do logging recovery, how to do concurrent control. We're still going to have to do that in our distributed system. Right? Just because we have more machines doesn't make these things magically become you know, super easy to do. It's actually the opposite. become harder to do. Because, again, we can't assume that our, our machines are always going to be reliable. So the way I've sort of set up the, the, the next three lectures is that I'm splitting it, the discussion up in between sort of transaction processing systems and analytical processing systems, OLTP versus OLAP. There'll be some stuff we talk about in this class that'll be relevant or applicable to both types classes of, of, of architectures or systems. But when we start talking about you know, distributed concurrency control, that matters more for transaction processing because analytical queries are read-only. So just as a reminder of what the difference between OLTP and OLAP and what the workload looks like and how we're going to design our system to account for these differences, in an OLTP environment, the, we're going to be executing short-lived transactions that are going to be read-write. We can read data and modify data from the database. Um, and the, but the amount of data we're going to read per transaction or modify per transaction is going to be small. Again, using Amazon as an example, when I go to the Amazon storefront on the website, I log into my account, I add things to my cart, I make purchases you know, for my, my, on my credit card. Right? I'm operating on just my, my records. I'm not doing you know, large scans across all the customers in, in the state of Pennsylvania. And again, these operations are very repetitive as well. Contrast this with an OLAP system, exactly as I said. Now we're going to be running long-running read-only queries that want, want to extrapolate new information from the, from the data you've collected from the OTP side. So I want to look at all the customers in the state of Pennsylvania, uh, what items do they buy mostly when, the, when it's a rainy day on a Monday in November. Right? So I want to scan a bunch of customers, do group buys, aggregations, and extract this information out. So we're going to be complex joins across multiple tables. Uh, and we, the queries that we'll be executing may not be uh, similar from one after another. Right? It might be somebody opening up like a, like the terminal and writing a raw query or an ad hoc query. Or it might be somebody opening a tool like MicroStrategy or Tableau and playing around with the visualization. Right? These queries could be different from one after another. All right, so based on this dichotomy now, now we start talking about and how would you build a, right, a system uh, to handle one versus the other. 
And the main difference, as we see as we, as we go along, once we start getting into the, the OTP specific aspects of, of a distributed database, is that because we have to do read and write transactions, then we have to spend more time talking about how we do fault tolerance with concurrent control when we touch data across multiple machines. When we talk about analytics next week, it's really about doing joins across multiple machines. Because that's, that's where we're going to spend all our time. All right, so today we're going to start talking about the, at a high level, the different types of system architectures you can have for a distributed database. And then we'll talk about the design issues, which you have to consider when you actually build one of these systems. And again, these first two categories, actually the third one as well, for partitioning schemes, these are germane across both OLTP and OLAP systems. Uh, but then we'll finish up talking about how to do distributed concurrent control. Again, applying the techniques we spent two or three weeks talking about, but now putting them in a uh, distributed operating environment. Okay? All right. So the first thing we need to discuss is what the system architecture is going to look like. And the way to think about this is that the system architecture dictates how the shared resources will be exposed and used to other processing units or CPUs in our distributed system. Right, the, the terminology is going to be slightly vague here, uh, what's a node versus what's a CPU, but it, it'll make more sense as I go through the examples one by one. But the way to think about this is that the, the only thing that can actually do computation, obviously, is a CPU. And they do computation on things in memory. But where, does it, where do we get that data that we have in memory? Well, we're going to get it from disk. So the system architecture is going to tell you how you actually access memory and disk. And whether you're accessing disk that's local to you, remote to somebody else, memory that's local to you, or, or local to somebody else. Right? This is what the system architecture is going to define. And it's going to now tell us also, too, how we're actually going to coordinate the operations between different CPUs and where they, how they're allowed to go and get and retrieve data. So everything we've talked about so far in this class is in what is called a shared everything architecture. And the, the way the world looks like in this environment is that I have my CPU, I have my local memory, and I have my local disk. And these are the only things I know about. I only know how to get data that's from that disk, and I only can put it into memory that's local to me. Right? Sort of think of this as a, this stack as a, as a single node. So the three different types of distributed architectures you can have are shared memory, shared disk, and shared everything, or shared nothing, sorry. So shared memory looks like this, where I have now my different CPUs, my different processing units, and they're going to access a single global uh, memory address space. And they're going to communicate with that address space over some kind of uh, communication fabric, networking fabric. I'm not defining what this is, right? It could be TCP IP, it could be InfiniBand, right? It, it doesn't matter. All the way to think about this is that, again, that this memory is somehow not local, could, could potentially not be local to my CPU, but, it, but I don't know this, right? Because I, I just see a single address space. And then the disk down below, again, is just sort of some, some single thing that I, that I access. I don't, I don't know where it is. A shared disk architecture is where now each processing unit, each CPU, has its own local memory, but the, the primary storage location of the database is now down on some shared disk. So the, the way to think about this is that, in this case here, say I'm building, a, uh, I'm, I'm building the lock manager, the lock table for my, for, as I'm running transactions. Right, the lock table is where? It's in memory. So in this environment here, there's a single address space of memory across all these different processing units. So everyone can read and write into the same memory location for my lock table. And I, I just, but it, that's all hidden, you know, how I actually do a write into the lock table is hidden by this, this messaging fabric. But I know there's some of the processing units, I don't know where they are, but they could also be writing to the same lock table as me. In this environment here, if I want to read and write something in memory, I know that my memory is not visible from these other processing units, so now I need to send messages to them to say, hey, by the way, I'm writing, I'm writing, you know, here's some state I'm maintaining in memory for, that's local to me. But now if I want to read and write to data on, on the database, that's all now going to a single location, to a shared disk. And if this, if this process unit writes data here, 
then this guy, when he goes to read that data, he'll go down and see that change. But anything I have in memory is going to be local to me. And the last type is called shared nothing. And this is where each processing node, or processing unit, has a local disk and has local memory. And the only way to communicate with the other processing units in my, in my distributed cluster is going over the, the, the network. So if I want to read data that's just like before, if, I, if I'm maintaining a lock table in memory for this processing unit here, nobody else can see that. So in order for them to know about it, I have to send a message over the network and say, hey, oh, by the way, here, here's, what, here's what's in my lock table. Here's what I'm doing. But then likewise, if I write data that now goes to my local disk, these other guys can't see this unless they go over the network and say, hey, do you have record 123? What's the current value of it? So I'll go, so I will say is the, I'll go through the, these two we're going to spend most of our time on, shared disk, shared memory. I'll talk a little, little bit, little, sorry, shared disk and shared nothing. I'll talk a little bit about a shared memory. Um, but as far as I know, nobody actually, no data system actually implements this. Because right? this is sort of like a, something you would have at the operating system level. All right, so again, shared memory is when you have the, the CPUs that could be running on a different machine or, or the same machine, it doesn't matter. But they're communicating with each other through some kind of fast inter interconnect over a global address space in memory. And this now, because it's a global address space, every, every CPU has a global view of the current state of the database. So everything is in memory, right? The way to think about this is, is you could have your process running SQLite, right? That could be on one CPU, and then you have another process running on SQLite, running on the CPU, and it knows how to communicate them as if they're running you know, in the same process. So as I said, nobody actually does this because this sort of, this sort of messaging fabric or, or distributed shared memory, this is something usually that's provided by like, at the operating system level, the kernel level. And the, 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 you have to make modifications to your database to be aware that, oh, I have these other CPU instances that are running other processes that are part of my distributed cluster. It's not like you can just take MySQL and plop it down and tell it to use this address, the global address space here, and it's just going to work if you pop up MySQL at different locations, right? Because they're going to think, each MySQL instance is going to think that it's the master of the universe, that it has control of everything, but now there's some other process writing to the same address space, and that's going to cause problems. So this is just not magically taking your, your, your single node database and using shared memory and everything works, you still have to modify the data system, be aware that there's other instances of the, the software running at other CPUs, but the way they communicate is hidden to you, hidden, hidden through this, this messaging fabric in the network. As I said, nobody, as far as I'm aware, no commercial or open source data system actually does something like this. What's more common is shared disk, and again, the idea here is that each CPU is going to have a single logical disk that they will read and write data from. Right? Again, think of this as I, I have, you know, my, um, I have my database process. Uh, just like before, I have to have, be aware that there's other database processes running on different nodes, but they're all communicating to the, the same disk. They're all reading and writing data from the same disk. Each CPU has its own private memory, and that means in order to coordinate any state we're maintaining in memory, we have to go over the network and, set, and, t and pass messages back and forth. So this is very common now in cloud systems. So you can think of this shared disk as just your favorite distributed file system, HDFS, or EBS on uh, Amazon, or S3 on Amazon, right? So there's a bunch of systems now that are aware that I'm reading writing data from HDFS, aware of the limitations and properties of HDFS, and they can design their architecture accordingly. So the most probably famous one that does something like this is, I mean, I mean Oracle, Exadata, and Rack go, go pretty far back. Um, there's a bunch of systems based on, based on HDFS, Splice Machine, Stinger, HBase, um, Snowflake, and Aurora are built on top of S3 or, or, or EBS, right? Again, there's a single location of, of, the, of the disk that you multiple nodes can read and write to. So let me give an example. So the way you think about this is that, again, these nodes are stateless in that the, consider the database is, is the state, 
right? If we shut the system down, we want to preserve that state. These guys are stateless. They just have local memory that they're just using as the buffer pool, the same way that we use a buffer pool in a single node. And then we have our, our, our shared disk as some storage device, we don't know, we don't really care, that all these different nodes can read and write to. So we won't talk about this now just yet, we'll talk about this in a second, but assume that the application server knows how to, to communicate with both of these nodes to go get the right data that it needs. So let's say it wants to say, I'll, give me the record that has for, for ID 101, right? Somehow the application server knows it, knows, knows it go to this node here. And then the same thing we did before on a, on a single node system, we had a page directory where we, we do a lookup and say ID 101, well, that's going to be in page ABC. So let me go out to my shared disk storage, go get page ABC, bring it into my buffer pool memory, and then do whatever computation that, that I want to do for the query. If I want to do page, you know, get ID 200, same thing that goes to this node here. This guy knows that it's page XYZ and goes out to the shared disk and get it. Yes? Perfect. So he says, do I need a load balancer or a manager, a coordinator, if you will, in front of these two nodes? Potentially, yes, not always. We'll talk about that in a second. Right? Because his question is like essentially saying, this guy, somehow the application's ever knew to go for one on one go here. This guy wants 200, so he goes there. How do they know that? We'll talk about that in a second. But this is the idea I wanna, I wanna stress here is that like these, this memory, there's no sort of database storage at these nodes. Everything's always out on this shared disk. So I can have page XYZ in my buffer pool cache so that the next time somebody asks get, get ID equal 200, I know that I don't need to go out the disk to get it, I already have it. But I can, cr I can kill this thing and I don't, I'm not corrupting the database because that's stored out here. So the big advantage, is sort of as, as, as I was sort of saying now, the big advantage of, of, of a shared disk architecture is that these guys, again, are stateless. So if I now want to scale up my compute layer, I want to add more nodes so I can execute more queries uh, in parallel, then I just bring up a new machine. Internally, I somehow, I somehow update everything so that if I want to get now you know, ID 101, I go here instead of here. And it does the same thing, goes out, goes out the shared disk and brings it into the buffer pool. But I didn't have to move really any data. All I need to do is update the routing table and say, all right, ID 101 goes in the middle now. So when everything's read-only, this is fine. Where things get tricky now if you want to support updates in this environment, because now if, if I'm not careful and if, if I'm allowing any node to go read any data that it wants, if I say update 101 here, and I want to write it out to the disk, then I potentially need to send messages now to these other guys and say, hey, if you have 101 in memory, here's the new version of it. The way to avoid this is again, just to do strict partitioning so that no other node could ever look at 101, right? You know only the top guy can do this. But in, in general, if you, wanted to, if you wanted to allow anybody to read anything, you have to maintain the state in memory to send past messages to say, hey, I have the new version. Because otherwise what's going to happen is that if the next guy tries to read 101, maybe goes down here, if he doesn't know that this guy updated and I get it in between, you know, the update happens here before I write it out the disk, then I may end up going out the disk and reading the older version, which is, may not be what I want. The other thing I want to say too, uh, sort of the animation got a little out of order, but like the advantage of this approach as well is like, say this is using Amazon EBS or using HDFS, right? Underneath the covers, if I want to now scale up my computing or my, my storage capacity, then I can just add new disk at the storage layer. I don't change anything in the front end because they don't know, they don't care that underneath the covers, now I have more disk, I have greater capacity. Right, because these guys are, are stateless. Right, they're stateless in the terms of as I'm executing queries, there's some state, but like I can kill them and then go away and everything still persisted out here on the shared disk. Yes? You mentioned the, uh, the strict partition. What if a, a certain range of partition is pretty complicated at, the, at one time, but you only have one node for that partition? You... So he says, uh, he says, what would happen if that there's a partition that is, is, is hot, meaning like a lot of queries are trying to read and write to it. But and now I'm maxing out the capacity of what I can do on a single node, right? How do I handle that? 
So typically what happens is um, you, you isolate that, you try to isolate the hot items. And then you basically scale up, not out. So this would be scaling out. So I have two nodes, and now I go to three. Right? I'm scaling out horizontally. Scaling up would be this node is getting all the traffic. I can't split that data item up and put it across multiple machines because I'm, um, you know, because that doesn't make any sense. Because now I may be trying to update the same thing on two different machines, and I end up going to be even worse because now I need to coordinate across two machines. So you basically say, all right, well, this node is. It's usually like you know, the, like on Twitter. Like there's a whole separate machine for Justin Bieber, a whole separate machine for Donald Trump, for better or worse, right? Because everyone's trying to read his his data, so you can add more capacity for just that just his partition, right? So you can say, all right, everything's trying to go to this node here. I can't split that data item up because it doesn't make any sense. So I'll just add more capacity to this to this single node here. That's a very common approach. Do not want to install Windows Update. Okay. So the alternative to is of shared disk is shared nothing. This is what most people think of when you think of a shared uh, distributed database. You think of this model. Again, you have on a single node, you have your local disk, you have your local memory, and you have your local CPU. And that CPU can access that read, read, write, that memory and disk, you know, directly on on its local box without sending any messages over the network. But if it needs to now read data or read state or communicated state with other nodes in the cluster, you have to go over the messaging fabric. You have to go over the network. Right? And so the, the benefit of this is that, in theory, it's kind of easy to increase capacity now because I can just add new machines and now start reshuffling the data. Where things get really tricky, though, is that if you now need to ensure consistency across these different nodes. Not, need, not only do I need to, 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 to coordinate on the state of memory for each node, now I need to coordinate on the state of the disk. Right? In the shared disk model, everyone is going to one location. Uh, in this approach, everything, everything is dis disaggregated. So, yes? Capacity would either be, I, I want to add more memory, I want to add more disk, I want to add more CPUs. Right? Because again, it's like, um, well, we, we'll talk in a second. Like, shared disk actually sometimes is, is actually easier because I can scale up the compute layer and the storage layer independently. I can add more compute nodes without modifying how the disk looks like. Yeah, I would say it's easy to increase capacity, but not easier than shared disk. I think actually shared disk is easier. So again, this is what people, most people think of when you think of a distributed database. There's a ton of systems that are based on the shared nothing architecture. Uh, one of my advisors, Mike Stonebreaker, wrote a paper in 1980, whatever, you know, espousing the benefits and the superiority of shared nothing, of a shared nothing architecture, of a shared disk. I actually think the trend is actually in the opposite direction now. I think shared disk is going to be the prevalent architecture, just because of the cloud cloud environment, right? You can have EBS. EBS can scale out infinitely, you know, in theory, from your from perspective of your database. All right, so let's look at this example here. So again, on a single node. Uh, we're gonna have our, we have a CPU, we have memory, and have disk, and it's gonna have some portion of the database, right? Whether it's all of it or a portion or, or, or a fraction of it, we can talk about that in a second. But in that, this example here, let's just do simple range partitioning. So for our key space on ID, we'll say the the node at the top has one to one fifty, the guy at the bottom has one fifty one to three hundred. So again, ignoring how the application knows to go to this machine, if it wants to get you know, record 200, it just goes to this machine and then goes and gets all the data that it, that it needs there. And then sends back the response. But let's say now if I want to get 10 and 200 and I send the request to the guy at the top, then now underneath the covers, the, the system will know that, all right, I don't have, the top node knows it doesn't have 200. It doesn't have a shared disk or it only has a portion of the data. So it'll have to send a message now over the network and say, hey, I know you have 200. Go get, please go get it for me. <laughs> If I want to increase capacity, now I actually need to reshuffle data. So let's say that I want to add a third node in here, and now I want to make sure that each, each node has an equal portion of the entire database. Then now the top guy and the bottom guy need to reshuffle and send the, some fraction of the data that they have into this middle node here. 
So again, in a shared disk environment, I can scale up the compute node independently of the disk of the disk because they were sort of separate layers. In this environment, if I want to add a new CPU, then I have to move data around. If I want to add more disk, I have to move data around. So is this, yes? So he says, what's the difference between this and, and database partitioning? This is, this is database partitioning. This is database partitioning in a shared nothing architecture. We will talk about database partitioning in the next couple slides. OK. So distributed databases are not new. They're old. They go back to the 1970s. So all the, 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 the sort of famous database people that have built the, the, the early first node systems, they've all built some variant of them for in a, a, a distrib distributed environment, distributed operating environment. So uh, Mike Stonebreaker at Berkeley, he was the guy that built Ingress and Postgres and a bunch of other stuff. Uh, in 1979, they have a tech report out of Berkeley that describes a system called Muffin, uh, which is a distributed version of Ingress. I asked him one, one day what Muffin actually stood for. It stood for and Ingress. <laughs> um, so that one was a prototype that never made out of, out of the lab. It wasn't clear that, whether they actually built that. Um, SED1, the, the system for distributed, distributed databases, one was built by Phil Bernstein. Uh, he was the guy that did a lot of early, early work on concurrent control and distributed concurrent control. Um, this, he built this when he was at the Computer Computing Consortium Associates or whatever. It was some old data, uh, uh, computing company that got bought out and doesn't exist anymore. Um, but this is the early work he did building the first true distributed database um, in the late 1970s. And a lot of the seminal work that he did on distributed concurrent control protocols came out of the, this project. That system doesn't exist anymore. That was just a prototype. Um, system R star was the, uh, the, the distributed version of System R built by IBM in the early 1980s. And this was led by Mohan, who the guy who, who did the airy stuff we talked about last class. Gamma was a distributed database uh, machine out of University of Wisconsin built by David DeWitt. Um, and then nonstop SQL, uh, this is actually, nonstop SQL is the only commercial one out of all of these. Uh, Jim Gray was the guy that was at System R, did the early work on, on two-phase locking and a bunch of other stuff in System R at IBM. He left IBM, went to go work at a company called Tandem that was building these super resilient and fault-tolerant uh, distributed machines called, called Nonstop. And then they end up building a SQL engine to run on the Nonstop environment called Nonstop SQL. So this actually still exists. Uh, HP bought them at some point in, in the 90s. Uh, and there's a lot, of, a lot of people, a lot of older enterprises are actually still running nonstop today. And it's crazy, like, the kind of shit they would do in here to make this thing like, super fault tolerant. Like, think of, like, space shuttle fault tolerance. Like, you have, like, three CPUs running at the same time, all doing the same thing. Stuff like that. All right, so. So now we understand what, what sort of, at a high level, what the system architecture is going to look like. And again, for this, the next two, three lectures, we're going to focus on shared disk and shared nothing. And I'll just distinguish as we go along when we're talking about one versus the other. So now we need to decide what, how we're actually going to you know, build out the full distributed database. And there's a bunch of questions we have to answer. We sort of, these sort of cropped up as, as, as we've been going along because uh, I'm sort of being, being very vague or hand wavy about certain aspects of how the application is, is communicating with the database system to find certain things. But now we need to talk about how this is actually going to work. So the first question is, most obviously, is how is the application going to find data, right? How does it know that I need to go to this machine here to go find record one, two, three? Then when we actually execute queries on this data, how should we move data around or the queries around to process them, right? Does it make sense to push the query to the data wherever it's located? So if I'm in a, in a shared nothing architecture, and my query wants to get record one, two, three, but record one, two, three is on a different node. Should I go send a query fragment to execute the query on that data and get back the result? Or should I move the data to the node where the query is running, then process it? And then how is the data system actually going to ensure correctness across multiple machines, uh, multiple nodes, if we're updating the database at the same time as, as we're doing other operations? So we'll talk more about this next class, but remember I, I skipped over consistency when we talked about ACID, and I said it doesn't really matter on a single node because it, 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 you know, the, the, the database is always consistent because you can see exactly what, what you wrote. 
Now in the distributed environment, this, this becomes a, an issue because if I write data on a single machine, if I write data for, for a record on one machine, but then I try to read that record on another machine, am I gonna see my own write or are other transactions gonna see my write? If so, when? So that's what consistency actually matters. So we'll, we'll cover that as we go along. So another high level architecture issue we're gonna have to deal with is what should the nodes look like in, in, our, in, our, in our cluster, in our distributed database? So one approach is sort of have a homogeneous cluster where every single node is sort of a first class entity in the system that can do all the operations, all the tasks that my, my database system can do. So the way you think about this is say I have five nodes, every single node can execute queries, move data around, right, log, do configuration, partitioning, can do all the things that I expect my database to do. So the advantage of this approach is that if any node goes down, then uh, I can bring up a new one and have that take over all the responsibilities of, of the old one. Right, this most makes sense in typically uh, in a shared nothing architecture, um, but you could still have this in a shared disk architecture. The other approach is that in a heterogeneous cluster, where you have, have different nodes that we assign separate individual tasks. And in order to, to, and I would have to communicate between those different nodes in order to do whatever it is that I need to do to execute the query, or, or move data around, or log, log, log things. Right? The advantage of this is that now you can have specialized nodes that can handle certain tasks, uh, and you can scale those things out independently from each other. This is sort of like the, in, the, in the, the shared disk model, I have my compute layer and I have my storage layer. I can scale those things out separate from each other. Um, but now, of course, this means that I have more moving parts in my system. I have to make sure all these different, uh, these different services I need from my dist distributed database are working. And I need to make sure that you know, they can all communicate with each other correctly. So no, I'm not gonna say that one is better than another, right? VoltDB is, uses the top one, a bunch of other systems use the bottom one, right? It just d depends on how you wanna architect your system. So let me give an example of what a heterogeneous architecture looks like. So this is actually how MongoDB works. So MongoDB has three different classes of, of, of services or, or nodes in, in your cluster. So you're gonna have a router node, a config server node, and then the shard nodes. So the way it works is the application server always sends every query request to the routers. All right, in this example here, we wanna get, get the record with ID 101. So the routers are stateless. They don't know anything about where to go find this data. All that's stored down now in the config server. So we send a request from the router to the config server and say, hey, look inside your partitioning table and tell me what partition is going to have the record for ID 101. And then the config server sends back this, this information to the router, and now the router knows where it wants to go out to the shard to get the data that it wants. Right? So each of these servers, right, the config server, the, the router server, and the, and the shards, they can all be stored running on separate nodes. And you can scale these things out separately from each other. Right? Uh, if, you know, if, if you want to be more uh, economical or thrifty, or if you're not if you're not taxing the node uh, for these different services, there's no reason you couldn't put these on the same same box, right? But if you wanted to scale these independently, you, you could do that. So, what's one potential downside of this? So now, again, for a single request, I have I have to do an extra hop. I got to go from my router server to my config server, and then get a response back, and then figure out where, where I need to go next. You know, obviously, you can cache some of this partitioning table up in the, in the router server, right? I just, it, it's, it's extra communication that you may not want to have to do. But for a lot of things, it's, it's, it's probably not an issue. Okay, so at a high level, what we're trying to do in a distributed database Again, regardless whether it's shared disk or shared nothing, regardless whether we're using homogeneous or heterogeneous cluster, is that we want to have what's called data transparency. Meaning, the application can submit SQL queries, or submit queries to our, our distributed database. And it doesn't know, it doesn't need to care where that data is actually physically located, or how it's being partitioned, or whether it's replicated at one node versus, versus another. We don't want to know anything about this. 
Again, the, it's the same thing we talked about when we, when we talked about parallel databases. I want to take a single, I want to take my same SQL query that I can run on a single box that is running with, and with one thread. And I want to take that same SQL query and run it on you know, a, a, a single box with multiple threads or run it on multiple machines across a distributed cluster. I should not have to modify anything in my SQL query to be aware of the, the actual physical location of the data. And that's one of the benefits you get of a declarative language like SQL. Okay? All right, so now we want to talk about how we're actually going to split the data up. So we already talked about database partitioning before. Right? We talked about horizontal partitioning versus vertical partitioning. But now we want to talk about how this is actually going to be implemented, how the, I mean, what, what this actually looks like. So again, the, we're going to split our database up when we partition it into these across different resources. Um, and this could be assigning now partitions to either disks, to nodes, uh, to single CPUs, to chunks of memory. It doesn't matter. At a high level, it all works the same. So in the relational database world, this is called partitioning. This is the term I use. If you're coming from a NoSQL world, they use the term shard. It's the same thing. It's a disjoint subset of, of, of the database. So they, uh, what's going to happen is we're going to execute a query, and the, the data system is going to take a query that, that was you know, originally written at a high-level language like SQL, break it into a physical plan, and now we're going to divide that physical plan up to fragments that are going to target different partitions or shards. And depending on whether we move data to the, shard or the, to the fragment that's going to execute it or we send the fragment to the data, it doesn't matter. We just know that we want to coalesce all the results that are generated, the intermediate results that are generated from these different query plan fragments, put it back to a single result, and then send that back to the client. And again, the client doesn't know that it executed on one machine versus a thousand machines. All that's hidden for, from, from you underneath the covers. So the easiest way to do partitioning is what I'll call naive partitioning scheme. Where you don't look at anything about how the queries are actually access the data, you just take every single table in your database and do a round robin approach and you sign them one by one to each node. And this assumes that each node in your cluster can handle a complete, uh, the entire table. Right, so really simple example. I have two tables. And all I'm gonna do is just say, table one goes to this partition and table two goes to this partition. That's it. And this is super easy to do now in, in terms of figuring out where queries need to go because if, all I have to do is look at my query and say, oh, it's accessing table one. I know exactly what partition has table one, and I route the query, query there. What makes this hard? What's, what's, what's an obvious problem with this? Yes? She says, if you need data replication. We're not there yet. We don't care. Yes? She says, not scalable, from two points of view. One is, again, as an example he said, if I have a hotspot and all my queries are going to table two, I'm going to stress this partition. I'm not going to be able to, to take advantage of a distributed cluster. I'm still running on a single box, so that's no better. Um, it's also not scalable, too, because now if I start doing joins, right, now I've got to move data back and forth between, if I want to join table one and table two, and it's a complete join, I need to move either all table one down here or all table two there, or be smart about moving to some of the data. Right? So it's not scalable. We're not getting any of the benefit of a uh, distributed cluster. So some data systems actually will do this for a subset of the tables in, in your database. So MongoDB can do this. MongoDB can tell you, you can tell MongoDB, hey, table two is put this on a single, single shard or partition on, on a node by itself. And you do this for uh, tables you're never going to read. So let's say you have a table, we want to just log events, you just insert events that occur in your application. You can just have all your writes go to this one partition, right? And you don't need to coordinate across any, any, any other nodes. All the queries just go there. Horizontal partitioning is what people most think about when they think about a distributed database. And again, in, 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 especially in a shared nothing environment. Again, this is where we're going to pick some number of attributes or columns in our table. And we're going to use their values to decide how we assign them to different partitions. And the idea, the goal would be to pick a partitioning key that is used often in queries such that most queries are going to end up being touching on, 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 on a single box. In the case of OLTP, that's, that's usually the case. In OLAP queries, that's, that's not always the case. 
And we're going to do it in such a way, and we're going to divide it up in such a way that we, we have an equal amount of data or, or queries or total load accessing or going at each partition. So we're evenly balanced across the entire cluster. Of course, there's, there's anomalies, like everyone wants to go read Justin Bieber's Twitter feed. Um, although he's a bit old, so maybe not so much. But Donald Trump, sure. Everyone, wants to go, everyone for better or worse, everyone wants to go, wants to go look at Donald Trump Twitter feed because they really like him or they think it's a dumpster fire. And so all that traffic is going to be going to a single node. So we want to treat that separately. But in general, for everyone else, everyone else is not like Donald Trump. And we want to divide them evenly across all the different partitions in our cluster. So we can partition our database either physically in a shared nothing environment or logically in a shared disk environment. So let's first look how we see just how you do horizontal partitioning in general. So we have a single table, and we're going to pick the second column here as our partitioning key. So in this example here, we're going to do hash partitioning. So that means that we're going to look at every single tuple, and we're going to take whatever the value they have for that, for that attribute that we've identified as the partitioning key, and we're going to run it through a hash function and modify the number of nodes that we have, and that's going to tell us what partition we go to, what, what partition this key should be assigned to, this tuple should be assigned to. And then when we load our database, again, we just run this hash function, and that tells us where, where they go. So now if any query comes along, and it does something like where partition key equals some value, I can just run the same hash function, modify the number of nodes that I have, and that'll tell me exactly what, what node has the partition that I want, or what, yeah, what node has the key that I want. In my earlier example, I did what is called range partitioning, where I said, well, ID from 1 to 100 goes to this node, ID 101 to 200 goes to this node. For different applications, one partitioning scheme is better than another. Right? If you're, if you're trying to do a partition on the, uh, on, say, an auto increment key, then using range partitioning is probably a bad idea because every insert is always going to be you know, 101, 102, 103, 104, and that means they're always going to go to a single partition. But if I use hash partitioning on the auto increment key, then that's going to evenly distribute the, the, the load, those inserts, across all those different, different, uh, the, the, the different partitions that I have. And again, if I want to do, if I want to do uh, quality predicates, hash partitioning works really great because I can jump to exactly what I need. If I want to do a range predicate, then it's a broadcast query because I, I, the hash function, I lose all notion of locality. I don't know where the data actually is. Yes? Her statement, her question is, is it true that the partitioning key will never change? You could change it. In general, it doesn't change. Think about this, right? So think in the context of OLTP. I build my application, and I'm going to use the, you know, it's, 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 it's keeping track of the university's uh, enrollment. I'm going to use the student ID as the partitioning key. The student ID value for an individual student could change, but I'm still going to want to partition on the student ID. I could come along and say, all right, I can't use student ID. Actually, when I was an undergrad, they used your social security number as your student ID, right? <laughs> uh, and then at some point they realized, oh, that's a bad idea. So then everyone got new student IDs. So you can imagine that environment, I changed my, my partitioning key from the social security number to the, the synthetic student ID. But that's like a one-time thing, where I would dump all the data out, load it back in, repartition. It's not like you're going to do this on the fly all the time. Yes? Good. So he says, what's going to happen if you add a new partition? Right? Because the issue is going to be, I'm mod by four. If I now have five, then we talked, about this, we talked about this before with hash tables. Now it's mod five. That's going to reshuffle everything. So in, with range partitioning, this is not an issue because you just split up the ranges. Uh, with hash partitioning, you would have to use something like consistent hashing, uh, which we can talk about when we, if you want to talk about Cassandra at the end of the semester. This is what they use. And think of it just as a ring where when I add a new node or to remove a node, I only have to reshuffle the data that's adjacent to me in the ring. All right, so this is an example of sort of, of physical partitioning, or could be, because you can think of this, these partitions being stored at a single node. In the context of, of, of a shared disk system, as I said, the, each node doesn't actually have any of the data. Right? They only have caches of it in, in, the, in memory in, in their buffer pool. Right? Out on the shared disk, I have all my data. 
So logical partitioning is going to be where I'm going to assign the nodes to be responsible for certain keys. Right? Again, it doesn't matter whether I'm using hash partitioning or range partitioning or whatever I want. Right? The idea is basically the same. So now what will happen is the application server says when I want to get ID 1, it knows it has to go to this top node here. And this top node is responsible for going get, get, you know, getting it from disk. If I want to go get ID 3, again, I go to the bottom. The advantage of this approach is that now any updates will only go to a single node here. Right? If, if, if I want to update ID 3, I know that this guy is the only one who can have a copy of it in memory, and it's responsible for writing it out to here on disk. So if this guy wants to go uh, get ID 3, it has to communicate through the, the channel here to go directly to the node to get it. It can't go out the disk to get it. Again, physical partitioning is in a shared nothing architecture, and this is where the data actually is physically split up, and each, each node is responsible for it. Right? If I want ID 1, I go to the top. I want ID 3, I go to the bottom. Right? And then if I need to go get any data, if this guy wants ID 3, it has to go over the network to go get it. But this is sort of anything where this, for ID 3 and 4, this is the primary storage location of that, those pieces of data is at this node here, unless I do some repartitioning or shuffle things around. Okay. So the goal in our partitioning scheme, in the context of transaction processing workloads, is to try to make every query be, and every transaction only have to touch a single node. Because if all my queries go to a single node, I know that nobody else, I don't have to worry about coordinating whether a transaction is allowed to commit with any other node in the cluster, because all the information I need to know about that transaction is at my single node. So typically you want to pick a partitioning scheme, or partitioning key, or keys, plural, in a OLTP distributed database such that you maximize the number of single node transactions. Where things go get, get hard now is if you have a transaction that touches multiple partitions. Right? This, is, this is typically called a distributed transaction or a multi-partition transaction. The reason why this is hard is now if I'm, if I'm modifying the state of the database across multiple machines, I now need to coordinate with them to say, is this transaction allowed to commit? And this is where things get hard. So again, if we're going to allow transactions to support multi-operation distributed transactions, they can touch data across multiple partitions, and they want to be able to update the database at the same time across those different partitions, I need to coordinate them. And so we're going to use all the same control methods that we talked about before. Uh, the, all the same protocols and algorithms still apply here. But now we can have different ways actually how we're actually going to maintain the state to figure out whether transactions are allowed to commit or not. So the two approaches that have a centralized model, sort of think of it as a global traffic cop that has a complete view of all transactions that are running in my distributed database, or I could have a decentralized model where there is no centralized coordinator, and all the nodes have to coordinate amongst themselves. So the, the oldest approach, the way to do this, in the, the, in the very first distributed databases, is, was the centralized model. And they had a... Um, and they used a, a sort of piece of software called a, a, a TP monitor. Now it's called, you know, the, 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 the abbreviation TP means transaction processing monitor. I think in the, in the original versions of the 1970s, I think they were called uh, telecommunication processing models because they were they meant to do with like, you know, think of like phone networks and things like that. And the idea here is that we have a centralized coordinator that is going to be responsible for coordinating transactions across different federated systems. Right, so I could have, say, say I, have sort of, I have one sort of application or one system running over here on another machine. I have another system running on this other machine. Both of them do transactions, but they only do transactions that are local to them. But now if I want to have transactions that span those two systems, I need something above them to coordinate them. And that's what a TP monitor uh, was, was, was designed to do. These things are so used today. Uh, there's a, Oracle has one called Tuxedo. There's another one from IBM called Transarc actually was developed here at CMU in Pittsburgh. Um, right, these, these were used, again, to federate systems that did do transactions, but only at, 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 a, at the local state. So now a bunch of databases will actually support the same functionality that a TP monitor will give you internally, and you don't need them, 
But if you're dealing with a legacy architecture that doesn't have this, you'd want to use something like a TP monitor. So let's look at how centralized core data would work. So we have our partitions with our data over here. Again, we don't, we don't care how it's partitioned. We don't care whether it's physical or logical or range or hash. It doesn't matter. And then we have an application server that wants to update data on these partitions. So let's say this transaction, we want to execute a transaction that updates, updates data on these three partitions. So in order to begin our transaction, we have to go to the coordinator and say, hey, we want to update these three partitions. We want to acquire the lock for them. So now, say we're doing the same two-phase locking that we did before, right, on a single node, but now we're doing the distributed environment. So the, the coordinator is going to have its own lock, lock table to say, here's the locks that are being held by actual transactions on these partitions. So once this transaction is, is allowed to acquire these lock requests, it gets back the acknowledgment, say, you have the locks, go ahead, do whatever you want to do. And then the application server is responsible for sending out the query requests to the, the different partitions to do whatever, they, you know, whatever modifications or read whatever data they wanted to read. When they're done with this and they want to commit, they go to the coordinator and say, I'm done. Please commit my transaction. And now the coordinator is responsible for going out to these different partitions and say, it, this transaction came along. It locked you. It did something. But I don't know what it did. Is it safe to commit? Again, the, the coordinator only knows that you hold the locks of these partitions. It doesn't know what you actually did at each individual node. So it doesn't know whether you're going to violate an integrity constraint or a referential constraint that would not allow you to actually commit. So now once all these nodes with these partitions say it's safe to commit this transaction, then we send back the acknowledgment to the application server and say, yes, your transaction actually fully committed. If any one of these partitions say, no, we can't commit, then the whole transaction has to fail. And I'll talk about in a second how we actually ensure that that, that actually happens in a second. So. Uh, as I said, TP monitors were first examples of this. Uh, this architecture is actually exists today. Uh, you can get something called from, from Apache called OMID, which actually developed out of Yahoo Labs. Think of this as a centralized transaction coordinator for HBase. Um, Transarc was actually a Pittsburgh company here that spun out of CMU, CMU uh, that built their own TP monitor or transaction coordinator that did, again, sort of at a high level the same kind of thing. If you ever wonder why there was an IBM office at, at the corner of Murray in, in Squirrel Hill, because they bought Transarc in the 1990s. Right? Another example of a centralized coordinator, which is probably more common, is to have a, a middleware system that sits in between the application server and the partitions. So now instead of going to, the set, to this, this separate coordinator and then sending lock requests, and then sending the queries directly to the partitions, I'm just going to send all my query requests to this middleware and the middleware has the internal state about where the data is actually being stored. Right? Just like in the case of MongoDB, think of this as the config server and the, and the router merged together into a, a single layer. And it has its own internal, internal uh, lock table. It knows what data is available. So again, the application server doesn't know that where, where the data is actually being stored. It says, just execute my queries. So then, it can acquire, once it acquires the locks, it goes ahead and executes whatever queries that it wants on the data, sends back the acknowledgment, then we go to commit requests, and then the, the middleware is responsible for going out to these guys and say, hey, are we allowed to, or is it safe for us to commit? So this is the most common approach people use when they want to shard MySQL. Right? Facebook is, is probably the most famous one of this. Right? They have a, you have a middleware layer that intercepts all the query requests, and then they figure out what MySQL partition or what MySQL node you, you should route your query to. Okay. So th again, these are all centralized approaches. A decentralized approach doesn't have any middleware, doesn't have any centralized coordinator. There is no global view of what's going on inside of our, inside of our system. So it's, it's, it's up for the application server to send a request to begin a transaction, and it'll pick some node in our cluster that's going to end up being the, the base partition or the home node for this transaction. Right? And this is going to be the, the, the node that's going to be responsible for determining whether this transaction is allowed to commit or not. So I could have another transaction request that could go to another node and that could do all the same steps. And these guys can run independently of each other. So I begin my transaction and then once I get my acknowledgement, I start sending the query requests to my different partitions. Again, I'm ignoring the fact of how the, the application server knows it can go ahead and do this. Right? We could have some kind of lookup server like in MongoDB or we can push down state about the partitioning table to the application server. It doesn't matter. 
Then we go do our commit request, and again, now this, this guy was anointed as the home partition for this transaction. It's responsible for communicating with everyone else and deciding whether this, this transaction is allowed to commit. And what's going to happen is at the same time where we're trying to figure out whether we're allowed to commit for this transaction, these other nodes could be also trying to commit other transactions that may conflict with my transaction, and then we have to decide whether who's going to abort, who, who has to roll back, or who's allowed to finish. And it's all the same stuff that we talked about before, you know, whether it's timestamp ordering or two-phase locking, all that still applies here. It's just now it's in a decentralized, uh, uh, decentralized environment. So distributed concurrent control is, is, is much harder here because not only do you have to worry about the, the delay of sending messages between uh, different nodes, we also don't have a uh, centralized view of every single transaction in the system. But there's other assumptions we made on a single node actually cannot be made here. So before we talked about timestamp ordering, we would say, oh, we can just use the system clock to decide whether one transaction is older than another. Now I can't do that because now I can't guarantee with high precision that the clock on every single node is going to be in sync. Right? I could have one node could always be you know, 10 milliseconds ahead, and every transaction that's going to start in that node is going to be in the future, and it's going to kill every, all my other transactions. We don't, we don't want that to happen. But I can't use a logical counter like I showed in Postgres because that's global state that now I need to keep in sync on every single node. So that means for every single transaction I need to start, I have to send a broadcast message to every single node and say, all right, add one to our counter. We don't want to do that because that's going to be slow too. So we have to adapt the same protocols we did for single node concurrency control to make them work in a distributed environment. Timestamp ordering we can get by by using a combination of of system clocks with a logical counter, and also you know using uh, um, using the host name to to, to 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 prefix that to my transaction IDs to make sure that I always at least have order of transactions going in one direction. Right, two phase locking is a bit harder because I need a global state of who holds what locks, so that we we have to coordinate over over the network, and the home partition is responsible for figuring out whether you're you're allowed to commit or not based on whether you have a conflict. So we'll talk about replication next next class. Uh, network communication you know, is it's much slower in this environment. So maybe the same protocols we used before may not always be the best for us. We also have nodes going down while we're doing two-phase locking or other timestamp ordering protocols. And now we have to account for that in, in, our, in, our, in our algorithms, and that's harder. So I'm going to punt on replication in this class. We'll, we'll pick this up on, on, on Monday after the break. But I just want to spend time a little bit talking about what two-phase locking might actually look like in this environment. So let's say now I have uh, two nodes, and this is a shared nothing environment, so they're communicating over the network. And each, and we're doing uh, uh, hash partitioning, where each node has exactly one one record. This has A, this has B. But now I also have two application servers at the same time trying to update the database at the same time, but starting at two different nodes. So the first guy here wants to do an update on A, but it's going to use this node as its home partition. And this guy is going to update B by using this node as its home partition. At this point, we don't need to coordinate because node 1 is responsible for A, so that's fine. Node, node, node 2 is responsible for B, so that's fine. So I can acquire the locks for these two records at these two partitions without having to ever communicate with the other guy. But now the tricky thing is that if I come along and, and, and the first guy wants to update B and the second guy wants to update A, well now I need to go send messages over to, from this home partition to this other partition to try to acquire a lock on A. And this guy wants to get, uh, sorry, the lock on B. And this guy wants to get, go over to the network and get a lock on, on A over there. But now I obviously have a deadlock. The tricky thing now is that who's going to figure this out? Because this guy over here, he only knows about his lock table. He knows that, all right, I control a B. I know I have a lock on B for this my, my transaction over here. It doesn't know that, that A is being locked over here, because it just sent the message, hey, go lock A, because I'm going to update it. So obviously, in our weights or graph, we have a cycle. But somebody needs to figure out where, when we have a cycle. 
So this is why if you have a centralized coordinator, this is easy to do because I, can, I know that this guy has a lock on A, this guy has a lock on B, and they have a deadlock with each other. And I can make a decision in my centralized view that I need to go ahead and kill, kill, kill a transaction to break the deadlock. And that's the benefit you get from a centralized coordinator. But if you're using a decentralized system, you, you have to manually have, or you have to, not manually, you have to have some way of recognizing that, all right, something's going on here. Let me go communicate with all my different nodes and figure out what's in their lock state, or what's in their lock table, and then I can determine whether I have a deadlock. So a centralized, the way to think about it, a centralized coordinator could end up being a bottleneck because everyone's going to one location to go uh, acquire lock requests and commit transactions, but I have a global view of the database, so that makes the algorithm easier. In a decentralized model, I'm able to scale up potentially more easily because I don't have a single bottleneck that everyone's trying to, trying to go to, but now I have the problem of I have to use, do extra work to figure out what the state of the, the world is. All right, so any questions about any of this so far? All right, we have um, 10 minutes left. I'm going to stop here, because um, right, this, this is now jumping into atomic commit protocols. So what have we gotten so far? So far, we, uh, we, know how to, we know the different architectures you have for a distributed database, right? whether it's shared disk, shared memory, or shared nothing. We know how to partition the data in the different environments, right? whether it's logical partitioning in a shared disk or, uh, or physical partitioning in shared nothing. And then we just covered now how do you actually want to coordinate transactions in a distributed environment, whether you have a centralized coordinator that everyone goes to and, and, and tells the coordinator what they're going to do before they do it, or as they're doing it, or have a decentralized model where the nodes themselves have to figure out what, what the right uh, course of actions are. So hopefully that you're starting to get the idea that this is, this is not going to be a you know, walk through the park because now we're distributed. We haven't even gotten to the issue of replication. We haven't gotten the issue of making sure that when we, when we commit transaction, that everyone agrees that we can go and commit, and we can commit atomically across the entire cluster. So we'll discuss more of this after the break in, on, in class on, on, on Monday. Again, these additional issues we have to have if you want to do distributed transaction processing. And hopefully, I'm also impressing upon you that this is really hard to get, uh, get this thing to run correctly. And if you want to get an idea of just how hard it is actually to get correct, uh, there's this great uh, uh, website from a, uh, it's a software engineer out of San Francisco called Kyle Kingsbury, and he has something called the Jepson Project. And he basically has made a torture device for distributed databases that he runs on open source and commercial databases and tries to you know, run weird failures and, and, and corner cases on these systems to see where they break, to see where they violate correctness guarantees that they claim that they have. right? And it's awesome because like, he does these write-ups that are extremely thorough. Like, it's not something you just read in your underwear and, you know, real quickly while you're, while you're eating breakfast. But you have to dedicate time to understand what the hell he's actually saying when he, when he talks about these things because they're really comp complicated ideas. And so what's awesome about it is he basically was just doing this for fun, on the, on, you know, and he got a lot of traction, a lot of people interested in this. Uh, and there's one example, I don't want to say who, but there's one database company that were making claims about how correct or how strongly consistent their database was. He comes along with his, his, to his torture tool, shows that it violates all sorts of these, these consistency guarantees, and they actually had to go change the website and the marketing literature to now you know, not say they're, they're as strongly consistent as, as what they used to be, because they proved that they weren't. So now he actually has a consultant company, um, and you pay him to come to your, your company and run his torture device on, on your database, and you, get, and you get certified by them. right? And so he has a whole, his, you go to his website, he has a list of all the different systems and what versions he's tried his thing on and who fails and who doesn't fail. So VoltDB, I think, failed. Uh, it, it did, it, it, my impression was it was stronger than the other ones. Uh, I think it was the worst. Um, at least the older versions, the newer versions have gotten much better. They actually now support transactions. And so if you want to learn more about this, go read his blog article, it's, it's awesome. He's a weird dude, it's awesome. Okay? All right, next class, replication, cat theorem, uh, and then real world examples of other distributed databases, okay? All right guys, uh, have a good holiday.
and I'll see you Monday next week. <laughs> That's my favorite all time. <laughs> what is it? Yes, it's the SP Cricket IDES. I make a mess unless I can do it like a geo. Ice Cube with the G to the E to the T. Now here it comes, Duke. I play the game where there's no rules. You pull me on the cup, so y'all move because I drink proof. Put the bus a cap on the eyes, bro. Bushwick on the go with a blow to the eyes. Here I come. Willie D, that's me. Rolling with Fifth Watch, South Park, and South Central G. And St. Eyes when I party. By the 12 pack case of the 40. A six pack 40 act gets the real bounce. I drink fruit, but yo, I drink it by the 12 ounce. They say Bill makes you fat. But St. Eyes is straight, so it really don't matter.